Hey guys, and warm welcome back to the channel. Uh, today we are going to be inking some watercolors that I have drawn out and ready to be worked on to get framed. Um, I wanted to go over a little bit of how I do some stuff. Um, obviously I thrift a lot of my frames, not absolutely every single one of them, but a lot of them. So I have to come in and like say this one for instance is square. And because that's not a normal four by six, you know, I would have to cut my piece down to fit it exactly. And that's what I've done here. And this is gonna be a new tardigrade painting. Uh, so once I cut that down to make sure it matches, I have to come up with the backing piece if it doesn't have any, and then like see how this one had all this uh, old paper around it to keep everything in. I will replace this or clean this up, I'm not sure yet. Uh, but we'll get to that part, you know, in, a, in another video. Um, but we're going to be inking stuff today while I'm chatting. Uh, and I just wanted to show you guys this thing real quick too. But sometimes, um, you know, coming up with the subject matter can be the most difficult part for me. Just, you know, how do I want it laid out? What do I want the composition to be? Am I doing something too similar to something I've already done before but I couldn't remember, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but one of the reasons that I draw everything out on Procreate and then print it and then use my light box is I can reproduce these if I want to um, and, you know, keep my costs down because no matter how many times I trace my own stuff, it's still an original watercolor because none of the watercolor can ever be identical. And then I also will come in and change up where I put some of my spots and my extra lines and just my little details. Uh, so this cuts down just some time, some energy. I can do it in front of the TV, watch a movie. Um, it just makes it easier for me to do the inking and the watercolor, which is the more fun part for me. Anyway, sorry about the ice machine. Um, so I use Micron markers um, or pens, whichever you want to call it. It's archival ink. They are watercolor, sorry, they are waterproof, uh, which means once I draw them, they will not smear uh, when I add the watercolor after it. I usually pen first, but sometimes just depending on how I'm feeling, I may watercolor first and then do a doing like even looser line work after. But because I like that kind of storybook, uh, vintage illustration kind of style, I, I like to pen my stuff before. Uh, it also helps me with uh, white placements because in watercolor, you know, you either have to do white very last on top of the watercolor or you have to do it by avoiding the areas with your watercolor paint that you don't want or that you do want white. So anyway, I usually use anything between a 01 and a 05. Um, the lower the number, the smaller the tip. Like this guy is teeny tiny. He's for the fine, fine details. This is an 01. 03 is kind of in the middle and then an 05 has a slightly larger tip. It's almost more flat on the top and it gives a nice thick heavy line which is uh, about as thick as I go actually. Um, and then I have some extras here. I almost always use a white pearl paper mate eraser. I don't like the pink ones because sometimes they can leave the color behind. So I think that's definitely a huge requirement for me. Um, but we are gonna start on this guy today. It's just a mushroom turning into a crystal or a mushroom growing off of a crystal, however you wanna look at it. Um, and I'm gonna start with the heavy outline and then I'm gonna work my way in to the finer details. Uh, and like this one is one of the ones that I would definitely want to do first because it's going to have lots of white up here where you have those mushroom, I don't know what you call these actually, 
They're just like the little white things that grow on the tops of mushroom. And actually, I think it's just part of the mushroom that like blemishes. I don't know what you would call that. Anyway, so I would come through here. I am a really loose outliner. I don't like to do complete full strokes all the time because I like that really loose look. Although that is something I'm probably going to have to change because I need to have, you know, nice closed areas for when I do coloring pages. But I had a conversation a while back with um, a guy who said, you know, tracing is tracing. You shouldn't trace as an artist, but I disagree. So if any of you have, you know, your own opinions on that, I'd love to know what you think in the comments. But, you know, I feel like if you're not trying to pass off a piece of work as something you yourself have done when it was clearly someone else's, I think that is absolutely wrong. But I do believe that sometimes tracing is the only way you can truly learn form. And, you know, maybe if drawing 3D especially is difficult for you and you want to draw things in perspective, I really think taking like a picture of a city and then learning how to draw perspective by tracing a picture of a city, I think that's perfectly fine. Um, what you're trying to achieve is making it your own anyway. And if you're learning how to do that, you're not going to be perfect at it to begin with. Um, when I draw lizards and frogs and things that I'm not really super comfortable with, like I can kind of bust out mushrooms now. That's not really anything that I have problems with, but that wasn't always the case. Um, you know, I would trace books, pictures, magazine stuff, anything I could basically get my hands on just to kind of learn form. And after a while, it becomes muscle memory, and that's how you help yourself, you know, get to the point to where you can draw things without tracing. And even though tracing is something that, you know, it could, it could hinder you, I guess, but because it's something that you're using as a tool. I don't think it's any different than a ruler or, you know, a light box to trace your own stuff. Many artists have to use light boxes because how do you think cartoons were made? Um, not all of that is free-handed all the time and you couldn't expect everyone to work that way. Or at least I know I can't. Um, so on this one, it's really, really simple. I'm literally just going to go back over my lines where I want them to overlap and where I don't. And then what's really gonna speak on this one is my background that I'm gonna kinda do almost like it's been photographed where it's gonna be blurry. But I always like to go back in and add these little, I don't know what you call them, just accent lines. I think it gives you know, some movement, something interesting to kind of look at. It breaks up the piece and it gives you, uh, your different lines have weights to them so that they create movement. And, you know, I think that just looks better than a plain old, plain old line work. And I'm gonna make that really heavy because I don't want to double wall it into a, I just want it to be a really teeny tiny stem because a clover doesn't have a thick stem quite the way that, you know, flowers and stuff do. And then I may even add more ink pen to this at some point after I get the watercolor done to see if I want to add like, you know, some texture down at the bottom. I'm gonna move on to this iris. I love line work because it can be really relaxing. Like right now it's raining outside and besides me talking to you, there's like no sound in the house. Um, sometimes I do this with 
all of my laundry and dishes and stuff going and the whole house is humming and I really enjoy that. And then other days I like it to be nice and quiet. And then sometimes I listen to my Goblin Core playlist that I made. Uh, if you guys are interested in that, you can go to the description box below and there's a link for it. I will also watch YouTube and other artists working. I love watching other studio vlogs because it gives me ideas of not just art to do, but ways to um, be able to bring stuff to my channel that I either don't already or, you know, haven't figured out how to film yet because I'm still learning. Alright, and for flowers, I really love to add little little lines in the petals like you see. It gives them a lot of movement. Um, it kind of helps define where each petal is. And like, see back here, this portion is going to be a different color than the rest of this because irises sometimes have those little splotches of color on the inside. But I'm going to come back through here. Flowers used to be something that I found impossibly difficult to draw. Uh, this one, I looked at a picture and drew it and it turned out great, but some, some flowers are just so complicated and have so many little parts that you have to get right for them to look well made that I still have to get in there and trace them to really understand their form, especially roses or at least the roses that are like they have lots and lots and lots of petals. I'm not sure what the difference between those and like a, you know, a rose that you get in a bouquet usually, like your traditional rose, but the ones with lots of little bitty frilly petals is very difficult to draw. Um, all right, so I want this one to be a little bit more dainty than this last one. And because there's two of them, I'm gonna go with the smaller pin for the entire piece. The mushrooms are fun to draw because they are super organic and you kind of can't get them wrong. Uh, perspective wise they are a little difficult to draw sometimes but I really like how they can kind of just be a little all over the place because that's what mushrooms look like. Um, especially when they grow sort of deformed. Um, I have an idea for a drawing I would like to do that is just like super weird mushrooms and uh, most of them look gnarly like they've been chopped up by a mower. I find leaves surprisingly difficult to draw. Something about their organicness makes them more difficult than a mushroom, and I don't really know why. I think maybe it's because they are still somewhat symmetrical, um, especially if you're drawing them like perfectly from a tree. I find that very, very difficult. There's this one, almost done, I forgot. I'm gonna come back and add a couple more little lines. But 
Now, I'm no Bob Ross, but he was definitely right when he said there are no mistakes, just happy accidents. Um, it took me a really long time to get to the place where I felt that those were, those mistakes actually added to the artwork. All right, we are gonna keep this one really dainty too, but I need the line weight. So we're gonna drop down from a five to a three on some of this bigger stuff. Water is really difficult for me to paint, um, and this is going to be some really dark water because lily ponds, um, I'm sure you've probably seen it, but maybe not ever noticed that lily ponds are very rarely uh, clear. You know, you, you can sometimes see the fish come to the surface like when they have kois and things in them, but otherwise it's kind of like swamp water. It's really dark, and I've never painted that before, so... I'm interested in seeing how I take it on. Um, I am self-taught watercolor. Watercolorist. I don't have any formal training. I took one class in college and it was more, more geared to like prepping your, your canvases and getting that kind of stuff ready, you know, a little bit of color theory and some stuff like that. So I have some basics that I did learn in college, but as far as like really applying stuff and um, techniques, I've learned all of that on either YouTube, uh, online in some way, a few books. I've got maybe one or two um, other friends that used to watercolor that definitely helped out early on but for the most part I just kind of wing it if I'm honest all right then we're gonna add a few little lines here for the water There's that one. This is Ginkgo. Um, I'm technically doing this because Ginkgo is really popular here in Japan, but also when I was dating my husband and we were going to ETSU, the college that we attended together, um, in the science building they had a courtyard and it had the most beautiful collection of ginkgo trees that turned this outrageously yellow bright bright yellow color in the fall and i can remember several times that we would go sit on the benches in there or take pictures with our photography class and they make me happy And actually, I'm going to erase this bottom part here because I was going to make it for a taller frame that I had and decided it was going to go into a shorter frame, actually. All right. 
into this guy. This is for Japan. It is a Hercules beetle. Uh, apparently there are lots of them around right now. And we were going to go to a little beetle exhibit at the botanical garden. Um, but I'm not sure when we'll get back there, so in the meantime, I'm gonna draw them. Usually for legs and stuff, I go ahead and pin them in as straight black because I don't want to go back in and make that black as the watercolor because they're usually way tiny little bitty like cracks and stuff that I don't want to over end up overdoing. And then like little areas like this. Just to kind of keep it a little bit more clean. This one's a pretty big piece, so I'm going to go on back up to the five, the zero five. So I used to just watercolor and I didn't use to outline anything because I could not find a pen that would not smear. And I don't know why it took so long to figure out the right pen, but I had to do a lot of research to find microns that, you know, when you're not sure what to look for, it's hard to search for something, of course. So, um, my watercolor class, you didn't outline stuff like this. You, you know, just straight watercolor to paper after you've maybe drawn out your piece. Um, but I really like the way that it looks because it's, it reminds me of those older books, um, and cartoons of like, Winnie the Pooh and uh, Peter Rabbit and a lot of the time they use a brown ink instead of black because it's not so contrasty I guess um, or maybe that's just what made it look sort of vintage but I'm gonna try that sometime um, my awesome aunt uh, through David she bought me a whole set of these Micron pens and a whole bunch of colors when he went on his first deployment. And I mostly use them for like my own journaling and things like that, but they have brown in them. So I think I might bust those out sometime and see how I like that more sepia toned look. I know somebody's gonna eventually come for me with this like seaweed behind the tardigrade thing. Um, I know that they are microscopic and that this would be like some enormous, like you wouldn't even be able to tell what was behind it because you'd be so zoomed up on a tardigrade. But they are also called water bears, and I like the idea that they're just kind of, you know, floating around down there, having a good time like a, any other lizard or fish or whatever. So this is how I draw them. Okay. 
And so far nobody has said anything, so maybe I shouldn't have either. <laughs> All right, well, I hope this wasn't super boring. I just kind of wanted to show a little bit of my process. It's nothing special, but you know, everybody has a style and this is how mine is going right now. And who knows, maybe in a few days even, um, it may change. But thanks for hanging around with me. And uh, if you guys have any questions, just leave some comments in the, just leave some comments below. Um, we're going to watercolor these next, and then I'm going to show you guys what they all look like in their frames and ready to go for the next sale. Um, like, subscribe, leave a comment, and I will see you guys in the next video. Bye, guys.